Good morning, everybody. So glad that you are here today. Welcome for those joining us online. We're excited you are here with us. You know, we need to come with expectation, and I'm just expecting God to meet us. So I hope you join me in that expectation, and let's just open up with a word of prayer. Lord, we thank you and we praise you for today, Lord. And Lord, we just step into expectation for what, Lord, that you are just going to meet us. Lord, that we know you're going to just have wonderful things in store for us. So Lord, we surrender our time and our hearts to you and our ears to you this morning. We thank you, Lord. Join us today. Amen. Amen. If you're able, please stand with us this morning. I was buried beneath my shame. Who could carry that kind of weight? It was my tomb till I met you. Oh, I was breathing, but not. A life. All my failures I tried to hide. It was my tomb till I met you. You called my name and I ran out of that grave. Out of the darkness into your glorious day, you call my name and I ran out of that grave. Out of the darkness into your glorious day, yeah, yeah. Now your mercy has saved my soul Now your freedom is all that I know yes. The old made new Jesus when I met you yes. You called my name Into your glorious day, you call my name, and I ran out of that grave. Out of the darkness, into your glorious day. I needed rescue, my sin was heavy, but chains break at the weight of your glory. I needed shelter, I was an orphan, now you call me a citizen of heaven. When I was broken, you were my healing, now your love is the air that I'm breathing. I have a future, my when you call my name, I ran out of that grave, out of the darkness, into your glorious day. You call my name, and I ran out of that grave, out of the darkness. Into your glorious day.
We sing your praise. We sing your praise. I will lift you high. We lift your name above all names. Oh, yeah. me how to listen I want to know your voice show me how to wait through living in the natural rise above the noise. teach me how your heart beats Treasure is to mine. The surgery is worth it. Get below the surface and open up my eyes. I want to see heaven. So let your kingdom come. I want to see heaven, so let your kingdom come. Let it come, let it come. Faith can wait. The dead man and hope can split the sea, but help me to remember the kingdom of heaven is living in me. If death it was no match for the resurrection. King, yeah. then help me to remember that heaven is alive and it's living in me. Yes. I want to see heaven, so let your kingdom come. I want to see heaven. Salvation now. Yes, 
Yes, I feel the times are changing. I feel the walls are falling down. I feel the darkness shaking. We're calling up salvation now.
Jesus, Jesus, precious Lord, none on the earth or heavens above that I have found more beautiful. You are my treasure, my great reward. I just want to move your heart. It's all I want to do. I just want to stand in awe and pour my love on you, no matter how much the cost. I freely give it all to you. Jesus, Jesus, my offering, all my ambitions, my hopes, my dreams, and here's my life, Lord, a sacrifice, no, just to bless you. I just want to It's all I want to do, I just want to stand in all and pour my love on you, no matter how much the cost, I freely give it all to you. where I want to stay, oh, just to dwell in your house, waste my hours and my days on you, on you. Give me the fragrance, then I'll pour my oil out, is it a life laid down? Then here I give my vows Is it a song I sing? Then here's every melody Just tell me what moves you Tell me what moves you Is it a fragrance? Then I'll pour my oil out Is it a life laid down? Then here song I sing and here's every melody just tell me what moves you just tell me what moves you well, I just want to move your heart it's all I want to do I just want to stand in awe and pour my love on you no matter how much the I freely give it all to you, all to you. Well, I just want to move your heart, get calm within your gaze, right here in your presence, God. This is where I want to stay, oh, just to dwell in your house, waste my hours in my
declarations the armor of God and I was like oh good everyone will know these and even I know these God and these will be easy and he's like I know you know what Teresa but do you believe it do you for your life I have equipped you for battle so let's declare these truths about the armor of God okay I put, I put on, on all, all of God's, God's armor so I am able to resist the enemy in the time of evil and stand firm. I stand my ground by putting on the belt of truth and the breastplate of righteousness. I am fully prepared by putting on the shoes of peace. I hold up the shield of faith. I put on the helmet of salvation and take the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Amen. You may be seated. So now we're going to move into offering time. If you offering you want to give in the offering plate, there's one back behind the audio booth. Envelopes are back there. Ooh, there we go. Um, and then also you can give online. You can always do that or give in the mail. So let's pray and um, just bless this offering time as an act of worship. Father, we thank you for how you've just... You never stop giving 
to us. And Father, we just pray that our hearts are in the same position that as we give to you, it's from a heart full of joy and gratefulness. And, and God, we just pray that you bless what is put in the offering today. And God, that you, you bless Inver Hills Church financially, God. We're, we're, we're asking for that in your name. Amen. Help us pack food at Feed My Starving Children on Wednesday, November 1st at the Egan Warehouse. This is a great opportunity for the whole family to be a part of a ministry that has impact around the world. The people that are receiving the food from Feed My Starving Children are often orphans, widows, families that have been displaced from a village because of their belief in Jesus Christ. That means you, your family, no opportunity for food, home, or work. And one of the things that we're able to do is get them the mana packs that actually help save their life. We will hear more from Linda Furry about a recent trip to Thailand, where she and her team witnessed firsthand the power of the mana pack. In the meantime, go to IHChurch.com to sign up for Feed My Starving Children. Space is limited. Our next Encounter Healing Rooms is coming up on Friday, November 3rd at 6.30 p.m. There is no better way to enter the holiday season than healed physically, emotionally, and spiritually. Please take the opportunity to come and receive from the Father. Let's celebrate the season by giving thanks for our many blessings. Come to our Thanksgiving chicken dinner on Sunday, November 19th, following the morning service. There will be a sign-up asking you to bring a side dish or a dessert, but register now at IHChurch.com. Parents, drop off your children at the church on Wednesday, November 29th from 6 to 8.30 and enjoy an evening out or a quiet evening in. We'll entertain the kids with dinner, games, and a movie. Register by November 26th to take advantage of this wonderful opportunity. Christmas tea tickets are available online at IHChurch.com. Enjoy this special holiday event as we celebrate the birth of Christ and each other. Add your own special touch to the event by hosting and decorating a table for eight. Contact Teresa Schley right away to let her know you're interested. Space is limited, so don't delay. Okay, fine. Chicken dinner on Thanksgiving. Got to explain that. For about 13 years, the men's ministry put on a turkey dinner. And we got up to about nine turkeys at one point, and um, I think we just, you know, ran out of gas. And uh, we tried the chicken from Coops a few years ago, and now by popular demand, it's back. So. If you're a turkey lover, you can find better turkey than this is chicken. You let us know. Amen? I'm going to have you stand with me, take your Bibles, and turn to Ephesians chapter 6. And we are going to continue the sermon series on the armor of God. Um, today's message is simply the body armor of God. Ephesians 6, verse 13 through 17. Therefore, put on every piece of God's armor so you will be able to resist the enemy in this time of evil. Then after the battle, you will still be standing firm. Stand your ground. Put on the belt of truth and the body armor of God's righteousness. For shoes, put on the peace that comes from the good news so that you will be fully prepared. In addition to all of these, hold up the shield of faith to stop the fiery arrows of the devil Put on salvation as your helmet and take the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. God, I ask you to come. Anoint, Lord, your Word, my thoughts, my words. Anoint this time together, both here in this sanctuary and for all of those watching online. Lord, that you would use your Word and the explanation of your Word to help people understand that we, we are in. We're in the time of evil, and the battle goes on throughout our lifetime, but God, it's all about putting on Jesus and the power of his might. 
We just praise you in Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Now, before we, we, we go any further, uh, there's, there's a slide here. I, I made Teresa do something, <laughs> so we're going to take a look at it, and then next week we'll finish it off. You know, it was my idea, and you know, sometimes not every idea of mine is a great one, but Teresa still goes along with me. So um, I'm like, okay, it's football season. Let's try to do the armor like a football uniform. And we ran into, you know, it's like, okay. So the first one, Scott, if we got it, is first of all, the armor is Jesus. So I'm like, put the J on the side of the helmet. So there we go. The helmet of salvation is the mind of Christ. It's Jesus. You put on Jesus. Take every thought captive under the obedience of Christ. All right? So then breastplate. So we're like, well, shoulder pads. And the shoulder pads is the E in Jesus. Well, it's his righteousness. And we know in the scriptures that our righteousness is filthy rags. So the righteousness we walk in is the righteousness of Jesus. He is our righteousness. And then the next one. <laughs> now, this is, you know, pads have come a long way since the day I played football. But this protects the rib cage and the stomach, okay? And so I'm trying to think what it is. The shield, S, shield, S for Jesus. So it's a shield of faith. And then <laughs> the pants would be the belt because the pants has to have a belt. If it doesn't have a belt, pants to the ground, it's no good. So it girds the loins. We also know that when it comes to armor, that belt is also what holds the sheath, what holds the sword. We'll get to that in a minute, but there's the U. And then the feet and the word are both the last S. Why? Because there's one more than spells out Jesus. So thank you, Teresa. Next week, we'll get through all the armor and we'll put it together. I don't know if you remember, uh, Linda, I think of you, but the last time I think I really did an Armor of God series, a friend of hers who, who um, served in a very specific way, um, I mean, on the front lines for years, borrowed us the body armor of a seal who died on, you know, over there, overseas. And we had that body armor on the platform. And when it was all done, I mean, he, he, you know, we had to get it back because of, I mean, it was entrusted to him. And I felt, first of all, I felt so honored that we had it here. But second of all, in the midst of what was going on at the time in Afghanistan, there was that sense that they, us, everyone, you have to put the armor of Jesus on. Okay? You have to walk in it. It is your defense. It is your protection. You know, in Sozo, prayer ministry, one of the things we run into all the time, the person that is in the way of God protecting you the most is usually you. And, and we all develop these self-protection mechanisms, sometimes starting as a little child. But we have to trust God enough to get out of his way so he can be our protection and learn to put him on and not be our own defense. And my own, del whatever, I, I want to say deliverance, but then you'll think I was demon-possessed. But my, my own process of getting delivered from that is, is I, I had self-protected since I was probably three and a half, four years old. As soon as I opened up the photo album Home Alone one day and realized there's no pictures of me from when I was a baby until I was three. And most of the pictures when I was a baby were in dresses. And I'm like, they didn't want a boy. They didn't want me. And it created this need to self-protect. And then it was there my whole life. And if I felt threatened by anybody, the wall would go up. And emotionally, I would shut down. And I'd lose friends over and over and over. And one day, God just gently showed me in prayer ministry the inside of that wall that I would put up. And it said protection. And then he picked me up and he showed me the outside of the wall and it said rejection. So when you're self-protecting, what you don't know is you're pushing out the people around you emotionally and what they feel is rejection. And if you keep it up, you'll lose your friends. And God's like, do you trust me enough to be your protection? And the earlier you put the mechanisms into place, the harder it is to remove them. 
But you have to trust God. So this, yeah, it's personal. But it has to do with this process. So what, what is the therefore? I don't see Deb here. That is like one of her key phrases in teaching precepts. Whenever you have a therefore in the Bible, it's what is the therefore? Okay? And if you look at the scripture, therefore, put on every piece of the armor. Put on all God's armor so that you will be able to stand firm against all strategies of the devil. That's what the there is for. He's the real enemy. People are not your enemy. When you have conflict with other people, usually it's your protector fighting their protector. You know? But ultimately, it's the enemy that is trying to break up relationships. I was just talking to Eli about this before this service. In fact, I apologize to the worship team. This is the second Sunday morning I've done this. Eli's been the first one here. I get in. We get talking about God. I get so excited. We're just, man, Sharon, and I forget to unlock the doors, and the rest of them are standing out in the cold. <sighs> but I just, we were talking about how it's, it's, it's always been important, but relationship is so important. Worship is good. The Word is good. But relationship is what builds the kingdom of God. And it's, you know, Hebrews tells us in chapter 10, not to forsake this, together the assembly of the, the brethren. One of the biggest attacks the enemy had in the whole period of the pandemic was to tear down the fellowship of the church. So it's like, hey, you think about a brother and sister in Christ you don't see next to them, give them a call. I was back in the sound booth running sound and I was like, text to this family, I hope all are well. It would be great to see you again. Hey, how are you? I hope your recovery is good. We miss you. It's, it's, you know, my first year as the pastor at some, I was 33 and some very experienced board members and their wife would say, hey, I noticed so-and-so wasn't there and God really put them on my heart. You should call them. And I remember going, well, actually, I mean, I will, but God put them on your heart. So you should call them too. Well, I'm not the pastor. And I'm like, well, you're their brother or sister in Christ and they're not here. Well, yeah, but it's like, there's no yeah, buts. Yeah, but it's live in the forest. It's like calm. And it was really re-educating the congregation to be the congregation, be the family, be the body. You miss your brother and sister in Christ, you reach out. But you have to put on Jesus to do that. And it's like, why? I, don't, I mean, I'm Minnesotan, Norwegian, Midwestern. Um, I'm going in just a couple of weeks to Columbia for 10 weeks in the mountains to train up people to lead people to Christ and pray for the sick and start Bible studies in villages. That does not come natural to me. I grew up in a family that has antisocial personality disorder. We never had a babysitter, couldn't have anybody over, couldn't have anybody to our house. I mean, it was like when I had to get up there the first time in speech class, which I tried to drop about six times, I mean, I could hear my heart pounding so loud, I was pretty sure it was louder than anything I said. But when you put Jesus on... He gives you the passion of the reality of Jesus so that your testimony is the power. I mean, it's, it's prophetic. It, it, it declares Jesus, but you have to put him on. If you try it in your own strength, you fail. So Paul Rapley, from the very first time I met him, I said, when you come to town, he comes home twice a year, I said, I'll take you to lunch every time and tell him I'm no longer embarrassed to be with you in public. Because if you've been out to eat with Paul... If there's anybody within a 100-yard radius that is limping, has a cast, has a cough, he just runs right over and, are you okay? Can I pray for you? Is it okay? I pray for you. No, is it from 1 to 10? What is it? No, I'll pray for you again. Is it, is it, what is it now? I'll be, and I'm like, you know, until I get over being afraid of that, ashamed of that, embarrassed of that, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to buy, buy a lunch. So now I'm going with him. And there's a camera crew. There's 13 of us. And... Um, he just asked for volunteers to go over the mountain and go to the other side to smaller villages. And I'm like, I'm your man. So be praying for me. But I know that every moment of that trip, I need to put on Jesus because any anything in my own strength is a waste of my time and their time. So you put on the full armor of God. The enemy is the devil. We're fighting against his strategies. That therefore is to remind us that this is a spiritual battle. From, with rulers and authorities in the unseen world against mighty powers in the dark world, against every evil spirit in heavenly places, do you feel the atmosphere shift when conflicts arise? I'm asking you that. 
And I don't want to focus on evil. I never want to focus on evil, the enemy, demonic, on Sunday morning because this is God's day. This is his time. And I think I, I have, I went through a, a master's level class that had this in it. And so much of the time was focusing on the principalities and powers and where they reside in first, second, third heaven. And I was like, that's not teaching on the armor of God. You know, I mean, it's, we don't need to be ignorant, but we also need to focus so much on the enemy. I mean, today at 12 o'clock, some of you are going to be focusing on some other kind of combat. And if you focus on doing your job for your team, you're going to do a whole lot better than if you are completely obsessed with focusing on what the other team is doing. And so many times in the church, we could, I went to a church when I was a youth pastor, and one of the first things I was given was a list of like 290 names of demons. You've got to memorize this. I was like, oh, no, I don't. Yes, you do. I'm like, no, I don't. And as I got to know the history of the church, they had had a split a few years before where a group would meet in a house with this evangelist had come through, and, and they'd start worshiping, and then they'd shut the lights off. Stand in just absolute pitch fat darkness. It's like, you feel angel wings yet? Oh, there was a demon, you know? Everyone in that room was tormented six months later. I mean, everyone was tormented. And it's like, well, well, duh. You stand in the dark and you try to experience, okay, like second heaven experiences. Why don't you turn the lights on and focus on Jesus? Because then he will be with you in the darkness. And sometimes we get into teachings like this, I'm just saying, the focus should not be on the supernatural except the supernatural one, whose name is Jesus. You're fighting the enemy, he's out there. Don't focus on him. You can feel the atmosphere shift. We overcome darkness with light, and Jesus is our light. Say, Jesus is my light. All right. It is only by the Lord's protection that a believer can stand firm against the strategies of the devil. And here's the how. In Romans chapter 13, verses 9 through 14, it says, For the commandments say that you must not commit adultery, commit murder, you must not steal or covet. These and other such commandments are summed up with one commandment. Love your neighbor as yourself. I have to say this. There are certain principles, there are certain things that we, I think by nature and by our culture, we're taught are soft and are weak. And one of them is love. But it's love that was demonstrated on that cross, and there was nothing soft or weak about that. It's love that put a plan in place before the world even began to send Jesus to redeem us all. There's no greater power than love. And so here in Romans, and and I'm going throughout the letters to the churches because this concept of one final thing put on Jesus is in all the letters. The message is there. But this one thing, so love fulfills the requirements of God's law. He says, love your neighbor, love does no wrong to others, so love fulfills the requirements of God's law. This is the power of the truth of God's love. This is all, it says, and this is all the more urgent for, you know, the lateness of the hour and the time is running out. Wake up, for our salvation is nearer now than when we first believed. The night is almost gone, the day of salvation will soon be here. You know, I could just park right here and I could bring up slides of Hamas and Israel and everything and I could say, hey, you know that Revelation says there's a standing army from the east of 400 million soldiers. You know that China has had 400 million soldiers for about 25 years now. That Revelation, when it talks about the battle of Armageddon, that there's a great bear from the north and Russia has threatened to get involved if Israel's too much in the Gaza Strip. You know, this could be at the end of the world. I haven't, honestly, it could be. But I grew up in the church in the 70s where we felt this way every day. And I went to bed afraid. Every Sunday was focused on fear. And you know, if it is, I mean, obviously, we're closer to the end than we were in the 70s. You know, it's kind of simple math. 
It doesn't matter whether it's modern math. You know, whatever math you use, we're closer. Is it today? Only God knows. Now, yes, we know the times and the seasons, and we see, are there wars and rumors of wars? Are there focus on Israel? All that, yeah. I have peace and excitement. You know why? Because I put Jesus on, and I know what my job is in the army of God, and that's to represent him every moment of every day. And that should, have cha- that should not have changed from the 70s until now. In fact, had the church operated that way all along, can you imagine where we'd be instead of where the church is today? So the phone's ringing. Messenger's going off. You know, is this it, Pastor? It's like, this is it just as much as it was it 20 years ago. Your call is the same. Your purpose is the same. Your testimony needs to be louder. Amen? So you put on Jesus, all right? You need to pray. We need to pray for Israel. I was so excited up there doing youth and, you know, tell the same old story. You know, it's like when I was a kid, only had seven in the youth, and my dad went and got a youth pastor, and we got these two white boards, and we came half an hour early to pray, and we put names in here, pray for people to get saved, and then we moved to this. Well, the youth group in six months was 60. At the end of the year, our events would be over 100. But the excitement was seeing a name on this board and being able to move them to that board, because we'd pray for them to get saved, and they would get saved. What was cool is I, I came up the next week because I'd asked the kids a few weeks ago at the end, now write the names that God puts on your heart on the whiteboard. And I come up and I'm, I turn around and the whiteboard is completely full. And that's exciting to me because they're getting it. Because there's so much power in prayer, but only if you put on Jesus, right? Remove the dark deeds of your dirty clothes, all right? And put on the shining armor of right living. This is Romans, people. Have you ever been reading through Scripture and then, you know, you you go to a text like, you know, Ephesians 6 and 10 and you you put on the army of God and you're like, I wonder if that's anywhere else. And you start going to a search and it's like, well, there it is, there it is, there it is. So here in Romans, it's take off your dirty clothes. Man, anything that you have is connected to the sinful flesh. Take that stuff off. But any time that you remove something, you need to replace it. So put on Jesus. Put on the shining armor of righteous living. Because we belong to the day, we must live decent lives for all to see. Don't participate in the darkness of the wild parties and drunkenness and sexual promiscuity and moral living or in quarreling and jealousy. Instead, clothe yourself with the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ. Come on, say that with me. Clothe yourself with the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ. Oh, come on. Let's do that again. Clothe yourself with the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ. (sighs) Then you will be a man of peace. And I'll, I'll say this. You'll be a man of power. Because we're supposed to walk in what? I mean, it's, it's, it's walking the Lord in the power of His might, not your might. His might. So, I mean, I mean, here's Romans, and it sounds like we're reading Ephesians chapter 6. Ephesians chapter 1, verses 19 through 23 says, I also pray that you will understand the incredible greatness of God's power for us who believe in him. This is the same mighty power that raised Christ from the dead and seated him at the place of honor in God's right hand in heavenly places. Now, he is far above any ruler, any authority, any power, any leader, and anything else. Where is he? You know, Putin's kind of scary. He's been moving the chess pieces and he's been playing risk all around the world while we're focusing on Ukraine. And Ukraine is good, but you can't take your eyes off the the whole board. You got almost 70% of Africa now lining up with Putin and lining up with China and not America and wanting to move away from the U.S. dollar into gold and, and we don't even hear about it. It's like a huge global shell game, but you know what? Jesus sits above every ruler. He sits above every ruler on this earth, and he sits above every ruler in high spiritual places. He's seated at the right hand of the Father, and he paid the price and beat the enemy at the cross. And we're, we're in an army like no other army who not only is fighting for victory, but fighting from victory. And we just have to learn how to walk on the other side of the cross. And so many believers are here, you know, 
in the suffering instead of walking over here in the power of the resurrection. But in order to walk in the power of the resurrection, you have to put on the resurrection, and the resurrection is Jesus. So you're putting Jesus on. What does that look like? Each one of these demonstrates what part of your life, what part of your soul, what part of your body you surrender to Jesus every day, right? This is the same mighty power that raised Christ from the dead. God has put all things under, um, under the authority of Jesus and made him the head over all things for the benefit of the church. The church is the body. Do you guys understand this is not my words, I'm reading the word of God? I mean, you know, it's, it's true, it's real, and it's powerful to the tearing down of strongholds. The church is his body, and it's made full and complete by Christ, who has filled all things everywhere with himself. If he has filled all things everywhere with himself, does that include you? Yeah, it does. Matthew 8, uh, 28, 18 through 20 says, Jesus came and told his disciples, I've been given all authority in heaven and earth. How much? All. Therefore, there's another therefore. Because your Savior Jesus, who has all authority and all power on heaven and earth, and because he lives in you, therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Teach these new disciples to obey all my commands that I have given you, and be sure of this. Be sure of this. I am with you always, even to the end of the age. A simple reminder. Jesus has all authority and power, and he is with you always. And this is how we fight our battles. Not in our own strength, but in the power and the authority of Jesus. Say it with me, in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. In el nombre de Jesus. Is that that good? Did I do that all right? I got to practice that, because pretty soon I'm going to be in these villages, and I'm going to be praying in the name of Jesus. I remember standing in the, 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 the absolute brand new recarpeted Hall of Congress in Santiago, Chile years ago. We're having a church service, Mike Shields. And then there was altar time. And sure enough, I get the demoniac. You know, I mean, it's just, just, it's just like every, it's like, really, God, every time. So this guy, you know, rah, 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 manifests right in front of me, you know. And it's like, I'm like, hey, Mike. And he's like, you got this, you know. Next thing I know, he gets pulled forward and I see a claw mark down his nose and blood just starts pouring out onto this brand new carpet. I'm like, hey, Mike. <laughs> and Mike goes, oh, that's not his blood. Uh, they, they sacrificed chicken over him when he was a baby. Just plead the blood of Jesus. It's all right. Yeah, praying over him, praying in the spirit, you know. Well, then I'm, I'm, I'm like, he goes to the ground and he's just thrashing. I'm like, hey, Mike. Mike goes, Ah, oh, it's, it's a demon. Just find out what demon it is, you know. <sighs> and, and, you know, you don't need a translator for this one. Espiritu de pornografia. Pornografia would be pornography. If you didn't think it was a spirit, you know, you'd just watch this kid. It can be. It's a process. You start out with sin. You start out with hmm, a bad habit. You start out with lustful thoughts. You entertain them. And then pretty soon you don't have a sin problem. The sin problem has you. And pretty soon you've opened up your life to the demonic. So I'm praying over this kid. Turns out he's a sophomore in Bible college. It's like the fourth time he's had deliverance. Deliverance happens. And when deliverance happens, not only do the claw marks go away and he gets up and he's of sound mind, but the, all the blood in the carpet disappears. And you're like, oh, no, that's not true. That doesn't happen. Well, I was there. <laughs> And I'm going back there, so please pray. But you guys know the story. I've told it many times. I didn't want him to be bound anymore, so I'm like, God, how do I get the message crossed? In his case, he was wearing a sweatshirt that said, remember anyone? The property of the Athletic Department of Ohio State University. And God gave me a word. And I looked at him and I said, from now on, written on your heart is property of the Lord Jesus Christ. And the enemy, he has no more hold there. And his parents just started weeping and hugging on me. And here's my point. 
If you don't bring Jesus with you and on you, and you don't bring Jesus into the equation, not only can't you operate in freedom that nobody else can be set free, but if you bring Jesus, the freedom comes with you and on you. Because Jesus said, go and make disciples of all nations and baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, and I am with you always. You're not alone, people. In fact, if you've been in the Brian Fenimore classes on the prophetic, you understand God set your life in motion before you were even a zygote, <laughs> before you even had light show up on the scene. He knew every day and every thought of every day. So when you walk into a situation tomorrow and you know you're supposed to declare Jesus, you need to know that God has already done 90% of the work. He's backed up the truck. Everything that you need is there, including Jesus in you and on you. You just have to step into Jesus and do the part, which is your testimony, to release Jesus into that situation. <sighs> hmm. Therefore, go and make disciples. So, put on every piece. Hey, if anyone comes in in full body armor and um, <laughs> it's all right, it's just a demonstration of the sermon today. Anyway, <sighs> put on every piece. Why? So that you can resist the enemy in the time of evil. What's the time of evil? What time is it? You know, it's like, what time is it? Is it evil time? You know, I'm like, no, come on. What, what's the time of evil? So I'm researching this. And I'm looking at the time stamp in the Greek and the Aramaic. And you know, what I, in, in really probably the most clear sense, the time of evil hmm, <laughs> doesn't end until Jesus comes. There's a real sense that the time of evil you, you come into the reality of the time of evil when you accept Jesus and realize that you're in a time of evil. And then you're in a time of evil your whole life. Now, the cool thing is that you're walking in righteousness and the power of the one who destroyed evil, but now there's a battle going on and he has chosen to destroy evil on this earth through, that's right, every single one of you were commissioned by accepting Jesus. You're in his army. So you, to, you are to be aware okay, that we're in a time of evil. There's evil all around us, all right? No, don't look around in the pews right now. That's not what I mean. Remember, the battle is not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers. <sighs> that you can be empowered by God to resist. What does resist mean? Well, it means stand, but it also means to withstand, to oppose, to stand against that evil. A Greek derivative even says to be able to respond in praise to evil. I mean, when, honestly, I, there are some times when evil happens that, I mean, when I saw the first videos of what was happening when Hamas flew in, I'm like, I was supposed to be with Brian Fenimore in Israel when that happened. We were supposed to teach at seven different churches and the trip fell through. I'm telling you, I'm just, this is me, right or wrong, is I'm wired. If I was there, I mean, I would have tried to pick something up and fight. I mean, I'm, I'm not going to stand around and watch babies beheaded and watch people be butchered. But I'm in the army to do spiritual things. How many remember John Pritikin? Remember power ministry, John Pritikin? We took him to, John Pritikin got on a plane. Now, John Pritikin is a Jewish American. John Pritikin got on a plane when, when that happened. And he's been in those kibbutzes that were attacked ever since, serving in any way he can, including giving his testimony and leading people to Christ. There are hundreds, if not thousands, of Jewish Americans that have stopped everything, got on the plane, and gone over there to help, especially believers, because they understand they're in the army of God. They're equipped. They put Jesus on, and they responded to the call, whatever it is. And this was a very specific call. So pray for them as they minister Jesus, where Jesus incredibly needs to be ministered. Evil, again, hurtful. <laughs> it's an influence, especially on the essentials of your character. It brings calamity, illness, disease. This is biblical translation of the word used in the text. So think about evil, the broadest sense 
of what comes against you. So we're in the days of evil, right? Yes, Jesus died for everything. And you carry the power of Jesus, but in an evil day where there is sickness and disease and calamity, where the enemy is trying to get in wherever he can. And this is why you have to put Jesus on and, and walk in the power of his might throughout the day, always, forever. When I looked at what time meant there, it said throughout your day, okay? Day meaning 24-hour period, throughout the day, always, and forever, no, you can get depressed by that, all right? Or you get empowered by that. I get empowered by that. It's like, thank you for the clarification. I should never take the armor off. So what does this evil mean again? Disease, illness, calamity, strife, attack on your character. Uh, <laughs> Dereliction, uh, viciousness, ferociousness, mischief, malice, guilt, um, it's actually a masculine form to describe the devil, sinners, bad, evil, grievous, harm, lewd, malicious, wicked. Don't think it leaves anything out. It doesn't leave anything to the imagination. It lets you know this is the evil we fight all the time. It's around you. So we are still standing when the battle is over. You're supposed to stand, abide, continue, hold on, covenant with God has called and empowered us not only to win the battle of our day, but to establish a beachhead for his kingdom on this earth. So, I mean, I, I've seen this my whole life in the church, especially the Pentecostal church. It's like something horrible happens and we, oh, we'll call a prayer meeting. And it's great. And we'll fight through that issue. And then it's like everybody goes back and relaxes until the next tragedy. It's like, no, 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 no. No, a good army defense the land every day, all the time. In fact, they take more land. They establish a beachhead on the new land. God has called us, okay, to take the territory for the kingdom of God. And he's the king of the kingdom, and he sits above all rulers and authority with all power and all authority. Are, are you, anybody following me? Good. Every piece, whatever piece of the armor that you are not walking in is where the attack will come. They're all connected. They're all attributes and characteristics of Jesus. Putting on the belt of truth. And all begins with truth. Now, you know, when I, I've learned this since a little boy, it's like you put on the helmet. You, when, you, when you recite it and every day, put on the helmet of salvation for the breastplate of righteousness, you put the belt of truth, you put shall you be the preparation of the gospel of peace, you have the sword of the spirit, the shield of faith, and then always pray. You know, you, you have the armor this way, but when you read it, it starts with truth. Because I really believe it does. It all starts with truth. Not a truth, the truth. And the life. <laughs> Sound familiar? Because Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Nobody comes to the Father except through me. So it starts with the truth. We can't stand or withstand the attacks of the enemy without standing in the truth of Jesus. How do you identify what's a lie? I worked in a bank, nice little, nice little branch bank behind about three-inch bulletproof glass on the corner of Lake in Chicago. It was a beautiful day in the neighborhood. And these drug dealers would come in and out of their sweat pants would pull out a roll of $3,500 to $5,000 cash and try to push it underneath that slot and we'd mail it to Colombia, to Ecuador. And that was my job. But you had to take a look through that wad of wet cash because you were responsible to be able to recognize the difference between the authentic $150 bills and the fake ones. But how did they train us? They gave us a real one. They gave us a magnifying glass. They gave us a list of characteristics. And they said, you get to know the real thing so well that you spot a counterfeit immediately. But you learn to spot a counterfeit by familiarizing yourself with the real thing. And the real thing is Jesus. Yeah. Mm. 
the truth of Jesus, if you put it on, you wear it, you have it in you and you know it, will, oh, it will keep you from so many lies that will destroy and hurt your life and your relationships. I tell you, in, in doing Sozo ministry, there's a whole toolbox of things you help people. The, the, understand Sozo, the Greek, one of the two Greek words for salvation, saved, healed, and delivered, rescued from the, anyone? What's the tyrant, Satan? Yeah, that's what both words in the Greek mean for salvation. It's not just, oh, I have my passport to heaven. I'm going to live in hell down here, but someday I get to go. No, it's Jesus died so that you can be completely free, completely empowered. How do you do that? By completely filling yourself with the truth of Jesus. But if you're not living that way, you're usually partnering with a lie. As a youth pastor here, doing deliverance, I remember getting the, the books of Dr. Neil Anderson. And it was so transformational because he said, you know, this isn't a power confrontation. Well, when, you know, demon manifests, and I remember being at North Central and this 14-year-old girl walked in off the street, and she's thrown around five or six grown men. And I remember real, reading, reading Neil Anderson's book and going, I think that was power involved there. And he goes, no, it's a truth encounter. And the truth is Jesus, and the truth is powerful, and you bring truth into the situation, and it's going to, what? We're fighting against principalities and powers, darkness and high places, evil spirit, but the greatest weapon is the truth. That's why the truth is first. It all starts with truth. You put on truth. You walk in truth. And truth, truth exposes the lies. So in Sozo Minister, and I'm praying with people, the number one whole thing is to help them understand that they hear from God, help them to hear from God better for themselves so they can remain free. But a part of that process, one of the questions, I mean, it, these are like now the two tools that seem to get used the most. First of all, it's what lie are my, Heavenly Father, what lie am I believing? And sometimes I can be with somebody for two hours and it's just that. Tearing away the lies they're believing that have kept them bound in sin and darkness when they were set free by Jesus but they've partnered with lies. And you can partner with a lie so long that you believe it is your truth, but it's a lie that's had you bound. And a lot of those lies have to do with your identity. If you're having an identity crisis today, you don't like yourself, you, you, you just, first of all, you're insulting the artwork that God, the creator, made. And the artist, formerly known as, no, not that one. The artist, God, loves you, the piece of art that he created. Please don't insult God's magnificent work because that's who you are. Anything else about you is a lie. You know, the neat thing about the Sozo ministry is it developed, that, that uh, it, it adopted the concept of, is it kons, Kinsuji? But it's what the ancient Japanese artisans did when, say, an emperor broke a very, his favorite piece of pottery, and they would fuse, he wouldn't, didn't want a new one, he wanted that one fixed, so they would fuse it together with gold. And the gold would actually seep into the pores of the pottery, so where the gold would bring it together was actually stronger than the pottery, and it was beautiful. And see, when you come to Jesus and let him show you where the lie is, and you let him remove the lie and pour the truth into the crack, the gold of the truth of God makes you even more beautiful than the original design. And in this passage, you need to know, since Jesus said to the people who believed in him, you, this is uh, John 8, 31 and 32. You are truly my disciples if you remain faithful in my teaching, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Your freedom is in the truth. It all starts with the truth. And the truth is Jesus. In fact, in that very passage, it goes on to say, the Son shall set you free. But the word there for truth is most specifically the truth of the reality of who Jesus is, because he is the truth. So the more you know Jesus, the more you'll identify the lies and you'll break them off and the gold of who he is will be poured in you. And it'll also, oh, it'll bring forth the gold that's already in you. So in this passage, the subject of truth 
is Jesus. The object of truth is his teaching. If that makes you uncomfortable grammatically, you you can go either way. It's Jesus and his teaching. Truth is Jesus. Jesus is the truth, the absolute, unshakable, unchangeable truth that makes us, makes up the solid rock that we stand on. And if you don't know the truth of Jesus, the rock that you're standing on might not even be the right one. Because in, in this world today, everyone has their own image of God. But if it's not the image of God that's in the Word of God, then it's not Jesus and it's not the real rock. And how will you know well, when the trials come? If you can withstand, like this passage says, if you can withstand the evil, you can withstand the attacks, then you know you're standing on the truth of Jesus. Because that's the solid rock. John 8, 36 says, so if the Son, Jesus, said you're free, then you'll be truly free. I'm telling you what I saw when I saw the Father. Words of Jesus. He's going, here's the deal. I'm the, I'm the Son. And if you believe in me, you'll be set free because what I show you is what the Father showed me. John 5, 19 through 20 says, so Jesus explained, I tell you the truth. (laughs) You know, when you're looking for truth in the Bible and you realize how many times Jesus says, I tell you the truth. Well, when the truth is telling you, I tell you the truth, you should probably listen. You know, truth is saying, I'm telling you the truth. The son cannot do anything by himself. He does only what he sees the Father doing. This is why if we'd live like Jesus, we would just, oh, it'd be so much easier. Jesus on this earth did only what he saw the Father doing, and he only said what the Father told him to say. Whatever the Father does, the Son also does. For the Father loves the Son and shows him everything that he is doing. In fact, the Father will show him how to do even greater works than the healing of this man that you just saw. Then you will be truly astonished. There, this is an, <laughs> it's an awful lot of truth. John 12, 49 and 50 says, I don't speak on my own authority. The Father who sent me has commanded me to what I should say and how I should say it. How many know that a lot of times, especially in you know, a relationship, it's not what you say, it's how you say it? I mean, communication is 87% nonverbal. It's like, what? What do you mean? <laughs> That's what I mean. Facial expression, you know, your, your body language, all of that. You hear what Jesus says here? He says, not only did the Father tell me what to say, but how to say it. Are you listening? And and you know what he did? He even sent you a speech coach called the Holy Spirit who lives within you. And he's telling you what to say and what not to say. And if you're married, you know that you've said sometimes those things that he said not to say. And you can't take words back. You might get a time out on the couch or someplace else, but it's because you didn't listen to your coach who's teaching you to just say what the Father tells you to say and even how to say it. Be careful not to speak on your own authority, (laughs) but speak what Jesus spoke and you will be speaking out of the authority of heaven. You know, here's the problem with being the pastor. I've been putting this message on for two weeks. I'm at a gathering last night with a bunch of you guys. Without even thinking, I just said something. I, and that rarely happens because I'm so in tune with Jesus. Okay, that was a lie. See, you have to identify the lie from the truth. Sometimes, you know, it just happens. In fact, when we get to the sword of the Spirit, I'm really excited next time we get to the sword. There's a silver sword and there's a gold sword. The silver sword is when you're speaking out of your words, and the gold sword is when you let God tell you what to say. The silver sword will cut, it will hurt, it will maim. Even though you didn't mean it to, the gold sword heals, unites, brings together. So I just said something. And it was just, it was like I reacted. Well, what I said could have been hurtful to somebody. I don't even know if it was. I was tormented until midnight, just praying and going, God, help me to be aware of every word that proceeds out of my mouth all of the time. Now, I, I got to be honest, I lived that way until I was about 45. 
because I grew up so religiously rigid, I couldn't even feel the moment when it happened because I was trying to decide if it was okay to laugh in that situation. So I'd be, you know, thinking of Scripture, asking the Holy Spirit, and by the time I would decide that maybe it would be okay to laugh, the moment was long gone. And I had to let God set me free because that judgment, that guilt, and that shame wasn't from the kingdom of God. It was from the kingdom of darkness, even though I learned it in the church. But just because I'm free doesn't mean I should let things fly. I, I, I don't even know if, you know, and if you were there, just let it go, let it go. Don't focus on it. But the enemy, because I said something without thinking about what I was saying and making sure what I was saying had Jesus on it, I opened the door to the enemy to attack me. doesn't matter if it had anything to do with anybody else. Because God is fine-tuning me to be able to go to another country and walk in and make sure every word counts for the kingdom of God. But I need to make sure every word counts for the kingdom of God every day of my life here. We all do. And you can only do that if you put on Jesus. He is your commander in chief. He knows the strategies of the battle. He's already won the war. If you want to know how to operate in victory, you put him on every day. And it starts with the truth of Jesus because that's how we measure every decision, every word, and every conflict. You know the real thing and you'll see the counterfeit a mile away. All right? I don't speak in my own authority. He only speaks of Jesus. In John 14, 6 and 7, I got hurry. Jesus told him, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. Nobody comes to the Father except for me. If you really know me, then you know the Father. Um, for now, from now on, you'll know the Father because you've seen him because you've seen me. If you love me, obey my commands, and I will ask the Father, and he'll give you another advocate who will never leave you. He is the Holy Spirit who leads you into all Truth. Jesus sent us a truth translator to live within us. Yes, the truth lives in you. Oh, man. There's so much more here. Gird yourself. Put the belt on. It protects your loins. Oh, there's, but, but let's just stand. Let's just stand. Because you know what we're supposed to do is stand. And in standing, we withstand the enemy. In standing, we hold our ground. In standing, we take territory. But let's just stand with me, and I just want you to just put your hands out, just close your eyes and say this. The truth lives in me. Oh, Jesus. Hmm. You know, I want, the, I want the ministry team to come. I was supposed to get to the body armor of the righteousness of God. I didn't, but let's just hang out in truth for a while. You see, the truth is the word of God, and the word of God is truth. So I think there's, there's you know, when, you, when, when obviously in Ephesus there were garrisons of soldiers and there was a purpose and a reason why Paul was writing in this language to that church in that city. But it fits all of us. But, you know, the belt, if you don't have the belt, you don't have a scabbard, you don't have a place to hold your sword. The sword is the word of God and it's truth. But the real, the reality of the truth of the word of God is Jesus himself, which is your truth. And so the two are so intimately intertwined and connected. And the truth is what is, establishes us. The truth guides us. The truth protects us. So I just want you to close your eyes and think of those. The other tool in Sozo I use all the time is who do I need to forgive? And I just want you to take a minute and ask Holy Spirit, just ask Jesus, what lies am I believing? And for some of you, it's, you did something at some point in your life and you're just like, it has defined you in a negative way. It's marked you. It's kept you from walking in peace and authority, for being free. But I'm going to ask you, it doesn't matter what it is. It literally doesn't matter what it is. Jesus took it to the cross. For some of you, it's something somebody else did to you. It doesn't matter. Jesus took it to the cross. And he took that pain, the guilt, and the shame, and everything upon him so you wouldn't have to. But in order to be set free from that lie, you have to be willing to forgive. That doesn't mean you let them off the hook. It doesn't mean you let yourself off the hook. It means you, you turn it over to the justice of the authority who is Jesus in his kingdom. Whew. 
And I just feel God is sitting on this right now at this very moment. And I just feel a conviction to say, in that courtroom, if you will forgive and give it to Jesus, the record of the wrong, yours or somebody else's, is covered by the shed blood of Jesus. And that's the truth. And the enemy has tried all along to keep you from believing that that's true. That's your truth. But it's, it's not only your truth, it is the truth. His blood covered it all. So Jesus, I thank you that you are the truth. Absolute, unchangeable, unshakable truth. That was the same yesterday, today, and forever. The real thing so that we can expose all the counterfeits around us. And Lord, we put on that truth. We walk in that truth. We embrace that truth. And we pray that that truth would identify anything that needs to be removed that does not line up and reflect the truth in our life. In Jesus' name, amen. You know, Pastor had said we need to step into Jesus and put him on. So this is the time. Take a step forward as an act. Lord, I step into you. I want to wear you. And Lord, if there's anything that has not, that I have not put on the truth, Lord, help me through this week so I don't take off my belt. Help me so that I don't take off my helmet of salvation. Lord, remind me, because I choose to put you on. I choose to walk in you. I choose to take you wherever I go so that I may recognize when a lie tries to come at me, when my thoughts are not right within you, I choose to walk into situations and that I carry you and that you make a difference in my surroundings, that you show me the steps that I need to take that you show me the people that need to be reached. Lord, I choose to walk in you, not in me, but in you. So Lord, I thank you for this message. And I ask, Lord, that you would help us to walk this week and walk forward, that we would be aware of wearing your armor, aware of wearing you in all that we do, in all the words that we say, God, that it would, we wear and recognize so people don't see us that they see you in us, Lord, so we can be the army, that we can be the ones to tear down what you want us to tear down, Lord, Lord, that we go forth in your power and not in ours. And I thank you, God, for that. And I thank you for my brothers and sisters. And I thank you for what you are doing in your kingdom. In Jesus' name, amen. You're welcome to come forward and pray and spend time with the Lord, and also have a wonderful week. Bless you all.